So I gave the talk with this title in several times, but with somewhat different content. So it was so Oppenheim conjecture and related problems. So first I will talk about some history. So it's. <coughs> So this was Alexander Oppenheim. So he was British and as an undergraduate he was a student of Dixon and as a graduate student he was a student of, no, sorry, as undergraduate he was a student of Hardy and as a graduate student he was a student of Dixon at the University of Chicago. And <coughs> I think it's 1929, so he, okay, so this is, he published a paper which was essentially his thesis in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, and it was about what maybe now can be considered as, can quote as a Markov spectrum for for dimensional quadratic forms, and I don't want to explain it there what it means, but then as a footnote, he stated the following, as a conjecture, stated the following statement. So let Q be an irrational quadratic indefinite form and this is in n is at least five variables so here it's irrational means so rational form is usually means that the form of rational coefficients and irrational so it's uh, in this setting it means that it's not a multiple of a rational form so it means that uh, the ratio of at least two coefficients is irrational now a form of real coefficients indefinite of course means that not Neither, no, neither negative definite nor positive definite. Okay, then for every positive epsilon there exists a vector with integral coefficients which is not zero such that absolute value of q of x is less than epsilon. So it's the main motivation for this <coughs> conjecture for this statement was the very classical Myers theorem which is about rational forms and this is now it's let maybe just not to well, okay to avoid confusion so just let use let's use different letters so let b be irrational rational 
indefinite quadratic form in n at least five variables. <coughs> then B represents zero over rational numbers, so it's then there exists x zero such that b of x is zero. So it's one can consider this as a so clearly it's one can reformulate this statement using this epsilon so it's because if b is a rational form and x is an integral vector then if the absolute value of b of x is less than this sufficiently small epsilon then b of x will be should be zero so it's so this theorem is okay it has many proofs but they are I think essentially all of them are algebraic and based on some study of rational forms. And as far as I know, there is still, until even now, there is no analytic proof. So it's proof for just based only on methods of the analytic number theory. So now it's. So here's n is at least 5. And for this statement, this is, of course, a necessary assumption. Because if n is 3 and 4, then there are uh, well-known examples of, of rational and definite quadratic forms in three or four variables which do not represent 0 over rational numbers over integers. Okay, so it's yeah, and so therefore this so why is the assumption n is at least five and so this for the original statement by Oppenheim conjecture by Oppenheim now, later on, it's actually it was realized that for irrational forms, actually, it's possible to weaken this assumption. And n, since assume that n is at least free. So it was realized by Davenport, his co authors, and also by also Oppenheim himself. But it was probably this realization came only in late 40s or 50s. So this was statement. So it's now historically the first result in the direction of this proof of this conjecture was due by Cho. Yes, so it's, I was born. And so before I formulate what he proved, so just let's make the following remark. So it's, so if the conjecture proved for some m, okay, so then it's also proof for n is at least m. And this is this reduction is very easy, so we have a form in n variables which satisfies 
all these conditions, then it's possible to find a rational subspace such that the restriction of this form to, of dimension m, such that the restriction of this form to this subspace of dimension m will satisfy also all these conditions. So it will be rational, indefinite. So it's quite easy exercise in quadratic forms. Okay, so therefore actually the most difficult case is uh, for original assumption n is at least 5 and for this stronger statement for n is at least 3. Okay, and so it's shall we prove this for n at least 9, but for Q is a diagonal form. So diagonal means that, okay, so we have this quadratic form, so it's, so there's this sum of Aij, Xij, so we assume that all f aij are zero if i is not equal to j. So it's so maybe it can be written qx1 xn is equal lambda one x one square plus lambda n x n square. And this is, okay, so this is actually a very special case of quadratic forms. And so this was, so Cho proved this for n at least nine, but actually it was a very short paper, maybe one or two pages. And it was, I believe, in mid thirties, maybe okay, maybe nineteen thirty six. And but the proof was based on the result of uh, but it's quite deep results by Yarnik and Walfish. Okay, I'm not sure that I write it correctly. Again, probably about 1929 or 1930. What? Uh, S? Yeah, S? 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 Counter number of lattice points and ellipsoids, which determined by positive definite diagonal forms. So this is so if we have an okay, so we have Q B and so it's not so many letters for. Uh, okay, maybe just I use here also Q. So let Q of X1, Xn will be and Xn square will be positive definite. Form. And we consider the number of solutions of X in Zn such that Eps, okay, Q, Q of R will be not greater than, so it's, we take 
when a Q, uh, Q of X bar is not greater than one, and then dilate this by the factor of T, so it will be not greater than T square. And then, okay, the main term will be uh, the constant which depends on Q, and then will be T to the N. And so this is a very classical argument, which is essentially due to Gauss. So it's the main term is asymptotically is the same when t tends to infinity, the same as for the volume. But more difficult, what will be the error term? And so this. Yannick and Walfish proved this for n is at least 5, that for general forms it will be capital O plus T to n minus 2. And so this is for all forms. And for irrational forms, it will be T to n small or T to n minus 2. And in particular, it implies the following for, this is for irrational forms. So if we have irrational form, positive definite, let's say diagonal and take the set of values of this form at integral points. So it will be a discrete set. And the statement that gaps between okay, numbers, points in Q of Zen. 10 to 0. OK, uh, for, so it's, OK, we have, again, uh, let me, if we have this rational positive definite form, then di diagonal, irrational, then, for example, we have this gaps and then they so the discrete set of points and then we have so values of this form so it's when it's these values tend to infinity then next value will be becomes very close to the this subsequent value is very close to the previous value OK, so this is, now using that, it's quite easy to show this. So we have this n is at least 9, so the statement of Chola. If we have this diagonal form indefinite, then we, OK, it's, we have some coefficients are positive, some are definite. So uh, we can assume that number of, of, of positive, OK, maybe either positive or definite will be at least 5. And so then we so assume that we have this number of positive definites at least 5. Then we have a sequence of numbers which gaps tends to 0. And then we can for a negative part, we can compensate this and using this fact about gaps, we can achieve this statement. So this was basically the argument for of Chola. Now actually this statement is, OK, this is for diagonal forms and 
probably 1950s, there was a Davenport and St. Louis stated this as a conjecture for, uh, for general forms, quadratic forms, in n is at least five variables. And then it's that you will have this positive definite form and then not necessarily diagonal, then the irrational, then gaps between points in the set of values tends to zero. Okay, so this was conjecture. And I actually, okay, well, so this, under this assumption was, yeah, I will tell what, it's, now it's proved. And now let me continue to talk about, so I will tell more detailed what. No, it's proved, no, it's proved under this assumption by, in full generated by Goetz. But I, I will tell the exact. Yeah, no, so, so the Cho essentially was, work of Cho was essentially a remark on this paper by Yarnick and Walfish, but Starting from 1946, Davenport and his co-authors so worked quite extensively on this Oppenheim conjecture. And the first paper was Davenport And Hebron from 1946. So where again this was for Q is diagonal and N is at least five. And this is for indefinite for okay, it's again. So the Oppenheim conjecture. So the proof was based on okay, an analytic number theory method. So you study in trigonometric sums, and then it's some careful analysis. In a sense, it maybe can be there's some analogy between some similarity between the work of David Hebron and Yarnick and Walfish. But, so this was only for diagonal forms. And the reason why it's for diagonal forms, so it's, yeah, this is, so it's in general, so one can consider this trigonometric sums of this type where, so x is x1 xn, so assume that absolute value of xi is less than some t. So this is, in general, is multidimensional tri trigonometric sum. And in the case of diagonal forms, this multidimensional trigonometric sum becomes product of one-dimensional trigonometric sums. And for one-dimensional trigonometric sums, so there was essentially quite good estimates, essentially go back to Herman Weil. And so there was a, just roughly speaking for one-dimensional trigonometric sums, so it's, there was a, kind main term, which is kind trivial, and the error term, which is, actually in most cases it will be, so there will be estimate of the order t to one half. 
And when we have this n is at least 5, then the error term will be compared to the main term will be we have dropped to t to minus 5 over 2. And actually it's uh, so essentially what we need the 5 over 2 should be at least 2 and then it's one can quite easily get the statement which for implies the Oppenheim conjecture in this setting. Okay, but this method was, so but this argument is uses quite heavily that uh, the form is diagonal. And so after that, so again, Davenport worked with different people and which was culminated in the paper of Davenport and to redo from 1959 and so then was for n is at least 21. Now the argument which was used by Davenport and, and his co-office in this series of papers was essentially some kind of reduction to the diagonal form. So we have a form in many variables, then one can find um, say five-dimensional subspace such that the restriction to this subspace, the form will be essentially diagonal, but it can be exactly diagonal, but it will be diagonal with uh, very good estimate and then using this paper of Davenport Hebron or more precisely the paper by Birch and <coughs> Davenport which was some st qu quantitative statement on this work of Diamond Paul Herbron, so it's one can, so the was proof for n is at least 21. Now, actually, it's maybe. A, mm -hmm. So, when we, the question is about getting q of x and absolute values more than epsilon. Yes. So, where does this epsilon come up in, in the, when you write this sum? No, I, I, absolutely, no, we, uh, okay, so it's, yeah, no, uh, okay, so you have characteristic function of the integral from zero to epsilon, yeah. and then you take Fourier, Fourier integral of this, Fourier decomposition, and then it's you, so this is, okay, so now actually it's uh, very worth, Wow, to mention what is actually done in paper by Birch and Davenport, you know, say for diagonal forms. And this is, so, okay, so we have this, uh, okay, there exists x such that absolute value of q of x will be less than epsilon. But uh, what we can say about the norm of this x? And actually, they proved so under let's say for let's say for dimension five that for irrational diagonal forms that it will be. So for every positive alpha, so it's, we will have that one can find this vector which satisfies 
this assumption that epsilon value of Q of X is less than epsilon is such that the norm will be less than epsilon minus 2 plus alpha. Well, okay, we've, of course, we have some coefficient here. Maybe, okay. Yeah, X is rather big, but not... Not too much big. Yeah, so, so there was some uh, power, and actually, in a sense, this is a sharp estimate. So it's for, even for the agonal form, so it's... Uh, well, okay, so for almost all forms, we can have better solution, but for... All forms we cannot have anything better than that. So it's so, so this strengthening of the result of the result of Diamond Porter Helbron was used in this series of papers. Okay, so now let me mention what is about positive definite forms and actually for so, for example, this conjecture of Davenport and Lewis, and actually for a very long time, it's, there was no proof for any n for general quadratic forms. So, it's even a, if n is extremely large, so it's, uh, it was not known, but, so actually, but, People in analytic number theory worked on that quite a lot, but some kind of breakthrough came when Benkus and Gatze so I forgot his first name. Vitas Benkus and Friedrich. Vitas Benkus and Friedrich Götze. And so they proved this for first for n is at least nine. And actually they proved this estimate which was in the number of uh, integral points and ellipsoids which was in the work of Jarnik and Walfish and, and then Götze himself wrote this for n is at least five again this stronger statement about estimate so it's so this work of Götz actually gives a solution of this conjecture of Darwin, Porter, and Lewis. Uh, probably it was stated in, in 1950s. So the actually the method of okay Benkus and Götz and Götz himself is yeah actually it's worth about to mention that. They are not number theorists, and they work in probability. Actually, Benkus passed away quite about 10 years ago. But it's, and they probably were motivated by some intuition, or some technique which came from probability. And So it's, uh, okay, in, in a sense it's, it's based on kind of analytic number theory, okay, some analog of hardy littlewood method, and there's a some, so there's a theta series, and so I don't want to write it. So theta series, then for example, gets a, so take square, it, it sums uh, set and sum, where you have quadratic form, then 
want to give some estimate for that and then one take the absolute value of a square, then it becomes double sum, then it uh, uses uh, some technique which is Poisson summation. And actually very ingenious argument. Okay, and then there's a okay, technique which is okay, also involves classical parallelogram equality. So it's yeah, and so that's I don't have time to go into any details. So it's he first uses parallelogram equality and then you have double sum, then it's becomes again another double sum then for one of the sums it becomes it uses Poisson summation and after that it reduces to some statement in the geometry of numbers. Okay, so this is for so it's okay, it gives the proof of Davenport the Lewis conjecture. Actually it's so this estimate, which was originally given by Yarnick and Walfish in for diagonal forms and for general forms by Goetze, so it's not no longer true for n three or four, but nevertheless is still one can one. There is no counterexample to this statement for n is a three and four. So it's this extension of Davenport and Lewis conjecture is not known for is not known for Davenport Lewis conjecture. Okay, so now it's more or less for a long time it was using analytic number theory method, so the best what was achieved was for n equal n is at least 21. Okay, now then in 1970s, mid 19s, Seventies. So, the Indian mathematician Raghunathan came with a remarkable observation that this Oppenheim conjecture actually for can be reformulated as a some dynamical statement. For okay, let's say for n is free, and actually because of that, for all bigger n, and the statement is the following. So it's one can so the dynamical statement. So it's, we take the very specific form on in free variables. You say indefinite states. So square. And so it can be actually any indefinite form on in free variables. And then maybe just take H will be the set of elements in the so in a self free R, so free by free unimodular matrices which preserve this 
form. So this is the orthogonal group of this form. So there was, uh, let me repeat, there was no, no, nothing specific about this form just still. Okay, so now we take the space omega three, which is, will be, okay, there's a, the space of unimodular lattices now free and so this is one realization another will be g mod gamma where G is a self-free R and gamma is a self-free Z. Okay, so this is, yeah, no, so actually why these two realizations are the same, so it's, of course, a self-free, so a lot of this means that it's uh, yeah, we take a basis and take all points with integral, uh, all linear combinations with integral coefficients. Okay, now there's this standard three dimensional lattice Z3, and the group of self free of course, acts transitively on the space of unimodular lattices. And the stabilizer of this Z3 will be exactly a self free Z. Okay, so it's, and the statement is if okay, we take a point Z in this omega free and HZ is bounded, so it means relatively compact in this space of lattices, then HZ is closed. Or it's equivalent to the statement that H by the stabilizer of this point Z is compact. So this is, you know, okay, we have very, we condition that on the orbit of this point, then it's just bounded, and uh, then actually it should be compact. A actually, in the classical one-dimensional dynamics of so this is, you say, hyperbolic dynamics, usually it doesn't, so we have quite opposite. For example, if we replace n is free by n is two, then we have, so then G mod gamma becomes S L to R by S L to Z, and then it's this H becomes one dimension of diagonal groups, and essentially it will be dy dynamics of the geodesic flow and for geodesic flow, we have orbits can behave as best as we want. So it can be, uh, the closure can be product of, uh, locally product of the interval and the counter set. So it's actually, can be very complicated. But, okay, so this is, uh, 
but for n is at least free, so it's uh, this was yeah, this is quite opposite. A actually, after and actually, okay, after I proved this dynamical statement, which so uh, so I looked at yeah, so sort of very uh, quite well-known papers by Casas and Swinnerton and Dyer. Nineteen fifty five, so this is mostly about isolation theorems. And actually, uh, in a sense, already in that paper, this equivalence between this dynamical statement and the Oppenheim conjecture was essentially established. So it's uh, more precisely, it's it's so all necessary ingredients are there. You know, so actually, I have just what I said. I have to be careful. So when I asked actually Swinnerton Dyer, did you know about this equivalence? He said no. But uh, nevertheless, so it's essentially it was there. But what? Actually, the most remarkable about this uh, Raghunathan's observation that, so what's the difference between n is at least three and n is two, then, so for n equals three, so this H contains Many unipotent elements, many unipotent subgroups. So, unipotent subgroup is a subgroup which consists of unipotent elements. Unipotent elements are elements with eigenvalue one, and somehow it's so his intuition was that when we have this unipotent elements, then we have much stronger rigidity properties than for, say, in hyperbolic dynamics. And actually, he stated uh, what was called Raghunathan's conjecture. So the special case of this conjecture is this dynamical statement and which, okay, I proved and then uh, jointly with Danny we proved this for some other special cases and actually this using topological Methods, for example, we used minimal sets, okay, and also some other argument, but somehow we're heavily based on this dynamics of unipotent, of action of unipotent groups, so in particular, okay, polynomial divergence. In full generality, this Raghunathan's conjecture was proved by Marina Ratner in a series of four papers, which is 1990-91. And actually, three of these papers were 
some proof of another conjecture which usually attributed to Danny about classification of ergodic invariant measures for unipotent flows. And the last paper was, uh, so using this classification also, our results, of, in particular about non-divergence of orbits of unipotent flows, which again is, so first result of this type was proved by myself in connection with the proof of arithmeticity of non-uniform lattices. And then it's with Daniel, there's a, some quantitative version of this. But so in combination, it was, about, so this four papers, about 200 to 250 pages. So now there's a, some simplifications and for example, work of Tamanov and myself, so it's maybe there's three papers are reduced to about 40 pages. But still, it's quite a long statement. But what should be. Um, what? Well? Uh, am I missed? So, my impression that you didn't formulate Ragonathan conjecture. Yeah, I didn't formulate it. But uh, so, Ragonathan conjecture, we have. Uh, Okay, group gener subgroup generated by unipotent elements, mm -hmm. and you take on say on orbit on G mod gamma S L N R by S L N Z, mm -hmm. and it, the closure of this orbit should be uh, orbit of some bigger group. So. Okay, so now it's. Mm. Yeah, so, okay, so, but uh, what is used in this? So it was ergodic theorem, so it's some generalization of Birgit individual ergodic theorem, but for multi dimensional subgroups, but also it's, yeah, no, so, uh, yeah, so it can be considered as, so here we have minimal sets, here we have ergodic theorems. So why do I mention that? So it's, and this is related to, so what can be called effective proofs. Yeah, so actually, in general, it is quite difficult even to give a formulation of this. But, for example, the following question. For example, take a very specific form in three variables. Or maybe a bit to use the x, y, and z. Let's say x square plus y square, let's say minus square root of 2 of z square. And now we, so this is irrational form, take epsilon and take the smallest solution of this inequality where x is let's see, free, x is non-zero. And now we want to give an estimate for the size of this small solution. Now the, you will look at this proof, so the Oppenheim conjecture, and this is 
or Raghunathan's conjecture, so it's, there is no, so minimal set is a kind, is not this notion which in general have effective version and ergodic theorems also, in general also there are no effective error terms. So it's the question what, for example, what can we say about this uh, estimate of the norm of x? Okay, I'm, I, already I have already mentioned the paper by Berger Davenport, which for diagonal forms in say in five variables, we have relatively good estimates. So let me, it's two plus alpha. Okay, so n is five. But, for example, this form, so it's, it's also diagonal, but the number of variables is three. So it's probably just the best known results as a recent work by Elon Lindenstrauss. And myself, which was recently, has been recently published in, I think in Israel Journal of Mathematics and for this, for example, it gives that norm of x is e to minus p of p of 1 over epsilon, where p is a sum polynomial Yeah, so it's kind of uh, quite bad estimate. So it's uh, actually I try to encourage students to maybe do some numerical experiments and actually to check what is the right uh, estimate here. So it's, yeah, certainly it's. I believe, and also many other people believe, that probably it should be some polynomial estimate. Now for the general Raghunathan conjecture, so there's a kind of work in progress by Ilon Linderstrauss, Samir Mohammadi, Mimisha, and myself, and there are some effective analog of this statement of Raghunathan conjectures will be Corresponding statement will be e to the e, so it's many expo exponents and actually number of exponents could, could be proportional to the dimension of the group. So it's, so it's effective but in very theoretical sense. And now just at the very end, so for it's... The for the rank. What? For the dimension for the rank of the group. Uh, actually, some product. <laughs> yeah, this, so it's kind of some kind of induction argument, but it's, yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, no, so one kind, some kind of replace, yeah, no, so it's very difficult to give any details, but, okay, now maybe about this effective proof, so it's, So I have already mentioned this work by Benkus and Goetze and Goetze himself, and so they are uh, effective in, <coughs> in uh, any sense. So it's, now there was a work by Goetze, yeah, no, actually from Okay, Benkos and Goetze. Uh, 
the Oppenheim conjecture, say, by analytic n is at least 9, and then Gertz and myself, so it was for n is at least 5, so this was published, I don't remember where, so, and this is, okay, there was only archive version of this, but probably for about 10 years, and And here, for this, for example, where if n is at least 5, so we uh, prove that norm of x will be e to epsilon say, minus, okay, some constant minus say, 12. And actually, it's not clear. It's so, okay, there's a kind of different arguments should be epsilon the same as for diagonal forms. So for general forms, there's a really worse estimates. Uh, okay, maybe now it's less than 12, but certainly <coughs> not coming close to 4. So it's, here's a kind of combination of methods which was developed by Goetze and partial collaboration with Benkos, but also some kind, miraculously, there's a, some uh, arguments from what is called now homogeneous dynamics, uh, and this was some analog of an argument which appeared in paper by Eskin, Alex Eskin, Schach, and Moses, and myself on the what we called quantitative open kind conjecture. And so it's probably I have to stop. So uh, could you say a little bit? more precisely about the uh, formulation of the statement of, statement of the Raghunathan conjecture. Yeah, no, so Raghunathan's conjecture is the following, so it's yeah, no, so originally it was let G be a Lie group. Now gamma in G is a lattice. So, yeah, a real Lie group. Yeah, no, so that was a generalization. Now, lattice means discrete, and the volume of G mod gamma is finite. And <coughs> let U will be one-dimensional unipotent subgroup. Now let also x will be in G mod gamma. <coughs> then the closure of the orbit, U orbit of this point, is Lx, where L is some bigger subgroup and also, mm -hmm. yeah, so it's closed orbit, and then it's actually the volume, the measure of L by the, of this orbit with respect to the hard measure is finite. Now it's, yeah, it was generalized when U is replaced, uh, not just unipotent subgroup, that, but the group generated by unipotent subgroups. Uh, so, isn't that a simple thing, not uh, arbitrary uh, unipotent subgroup? Yes. Uh, but just, how say, some specific ones? No, it's for, yeah, for any unipotent subgroup and for any point. It is unipotent in G? Yeah, no, okay, it's, yeah, maybe if G is a Lie group, so one can, should terminology add unipotence. So it's, we take a joint representation, then it's, yeah, so it's, if it's a matrix group, a linear group, then it's just standard definition. What kind of L do we get here? We get L, which is, um, 
no more or less. Yeah, okay, actually, yeah, it should be. Um, it would take, so uh, it's not true that it's generated by unipotence, but it would take, okay, we take you. So roughly speaking, we take subgroup generated by unipotence, then quotient should be compact. Yeah, it's not. In, yeah, no, maybe in uh, them. Yeah, for example, we take G is the SLNR, gamma is SLNZ. And let's say X will be this standard. So it's a point in Jamot Gamma. Then one gets, so L will be a Q subgroup. So more precisely. A real points of Q subgroup. In the Q that's the without non trivial Q characters. So it's Q okay, homomorphisms into one dimension multiply to group. Yeah. 